Here's my book review of Mistress of the Revolution by Catherine Delors. Mistress of the Revolution is a masterful, mistressful, serious literary work about the widely ignored and unlearned lessons of history. As the very best historical novels do, it reflects and highlights the political and social dramas of the present day. At its core, it's a story of class struggle and sexual politics. Main character and first-person narrator Gabriel de Montserrat is a gorgeous young aristocrat who lacks a respectable dowry. She is high-born, but from a family that has seen its wealth dissipate. If she wishes to realize the great expectations of her rank, she must therefore find some rich aristocrat to marry her. Her other socially acceptable choices are to live as a spinster with her family if they'll have her, or to become a nun. Her plight is the recurring dilemma of sexual politics. If she wants a good life, she must be willing to market her body and her charms. In this central element of the plot, the book is not much different in theme from the works of Jane Austen and the Bronte sisters or of Chicklet stories like Bridget Jones's Diary. The main character's all-important goal, which she must achieve or everything else in her life will suffer, is to become a rich man's wife. Throughout the book, which covers Gabrielle's story from ages 15 to 46, she is dominated by men in a series of fundamentally monogamous relationships. And here's where Mistress of the Revolution departs from its traditional sisters. Not one of these men, including her primary love interest, is what you'd call sympathetic in the modern sense. All of them, and there's quite a collection, are cruel, vindictive batterers. They differ mainly in the degrees to which they bestow the occasional kindness or largesse on Gabriel. It does make me wonder, though, how much, if anything, has changed. Love, money, property, these are as intertwined and interdependent in today's world as ever. Also remarkable from a technical viewpoint is the impeccable prose style of this book. Delore is a native French speaker, and English is her second language. The book is written from Gabrielle's point of view in 1815 while exiled in England. Like Delore, Gabrielle writes in her adopted English. In the historical note to the book's end papers, the author admits, I strove to write this novel in the British English Gabrielle would have used in 1815. I find it reads a lot like Balzac in translation, and I'm reminded of his A Harlot High and Low, written in the 1830s, and treating, as Delors' book does so well, the dynamics of sexual politics trapped in the web of human history. Gerald Everett Jones is the author of Bonfire of the Vanderbilts and host of the yet-published radio show. Here's my throwback, and I don't care if it's Thursday. Most women, I know, do not like to be photographed unless they are warned. They know that in reality, a camera does not always see what people see. And how in movies, actors go to great length to adjust to the camera's eye, especially for those close-ups where the tiniest zit looks like a volcano in the big screen. Among the early days, motion pictures were unexplored territory with artistic potentials no one knew. One talent was an almost forgotten director named Moritz Stiller. Moritz Stiller came upon a 19-year-old acting student named Greta Gustafsson. His interest went way beyond romance. People recalled him walking with her and silently coaching her for hours. We do not know exactly how Stiller knew he had talent, or importantly, just where this woman's talent was. But under his iron tutelage, Her face became a magnet for photographers from Cecil Beaton to Edward Steichen. MGM's Irving Thalberg saw a potential that led to her changing her name to Greta Garbo, and ultimately just Garbo. Somehow, Stiller turned Garbo into the supreme face of 20th century femininity. The end of Queen Christina is a long take of Garbo's face as she tragically sails to an unknown future. The director... Ruben Mamoulian told her to look sad. Her face was frozen. He tried anger, all kinds of feelings, and each time her face was immobile until frustrated, he told her to think nothing. But when the takes were printed, every emotion he demanded was there. She sent them to the camera, not the humans. When she went blank, 
the audience sent their own emotions to her image and her mysterious face hurled them right back at him. It is one of the most astonishing shots in movie history. Stiller never explained how he turned Gustafsson into Garbo. It is one acting method every school would pay in blood to know. Thomas Page is the author of the sci-fi cult classic, The Man Who Would Not Die, and co-host along with Cheyenne Cockrell on the Get Published radio show with your host, Gerald Everett Jones. Here's my throwback, and I don't care whether it's Thursday. Did you hear about the Irishman who wanted a new suit? Little Johnny was poor. How poor was he? John Stuart Bell's mom said if he got a job teaching math, he could afford to wear a Sunday suit every day of the week. Little John did that, and in the process, destroyed the universe as we know it. His work, entitled Bell's Inequalities, led to solid proof that quantum mechanics is true. Out of Bell's work came entanglement, a jaw-popping idea that was confirmed a decade ago in the Canary Islands and not by bird brains. Two quantum particles, supposedly separated by almost 100 miles, were proven linked together. Einstein destroyed time. Now Boyo Bell helped abolish space, too. Maybe he was angry about his youthful poverty. The quantum proof of human consciousness affecting matter has busted from its cage and is terrorizing the planet. Both the late Dr. John Wheeler and Dr. Alain Aspect of the French National Center of Scientific Research have all suggested the entire universe, all the stars, planets, supernovas, Movie actors, even Schrodinger and his walking dead cat, are nothing more than the contents of the human mind. This means the lovely Miss Cheyenne Cockerell, the lovely Georgia Umano, and the lovely Gerald Jones sitting with me were merely created by my own consciousness? Maybe I'm wrong. We could be in the heads of you ladies and gentlemen listening to this broadcast. Our listeners created us. Well, gee, thanks, Mr. John Stuart Bell. And that's a mighty fine-looking suit you got there. Thomas Page is the author of the sci-fi cult classic The Man Who Would Not Die and co-host, along with Cheyenne Cockrell, on the Get Published radio show with your host, Gerald Everett Jones. Here's my throwback, and I don't care whether it's Thursday. Kablooey, L.A. Before the 9-11 Twin Towers destruction, there was the Oklahoma City blast. But before them, America's worst mass blast was on October 1st, 1910 at 1 o'clock a.m. A time bomb in the Los Angeles Times building killed 21 employees slaving away for the morning edition. The real target was Harrison Otis, publisher of the Los Angeles Times, a foghorn who called unions corpse defacers. Unlike San Francisco, Los Angeles furiously resisted unionization, and Otis Times was the loudest opponent. As detailed in Lou Irwin's book Deadly Times, the reality of this action sequence contains no lesson for activists. The bomber was not an evil genius consumed with justice. Ordy McManigal was a working stiff trying to raise his family from the upper lower class into the lower middle class. Ordy's first job was beating up non-union workers on orders from the Iron Workers Union, who then ordered him to blow bridges and buildings down as fast as America built them up. This union was not about workers' justice, but join or die, just like organized crime. The bombings were publicly condemned by both socialists and the AFL. Even worse, at the bomber's trial, the great defender of the damned, Clarence Darrow, not only lost the case, but his passion for truth included bribery, jury tampering, and a very degrading lust for money. Only the bloodhound who caught the conspirators rose to heroic level. William Burns, the American Sherlock Holmes, was the real thing, a super sleuth at solving impossible crimes who nailed the bombers with the television night skill. Burns' reward was being denied the newly formed FBI in favor of J. Edgar Hoover, the incompetent who wouldn't leave, and insisted there was no mafia 
or organized crime right up into the 1970s. Three decades of struggle would pass before unions became a solid part of American life, just in time for the slow collapse and outsourcing of American industrial power. 21 working men were butchered by union working men to advance justice for working men. I tell you, any movie praising this is what I would call a bomb. Thomas Page is the author of the sci-fi cult classic, The Man Who Would Not Die, and co-host along with Cheyenne Cockrell on the Get Published radio show with your host, Gerald Everett Jones. Here's my book review of The Art Thief by Noah Charney. Noah Charney is a professor of art history and an expert in fine art forgery and theft. And in this novel, he proves himself to be a sly spinner of detective yarn. The Art Thief is a tale of brain-teasing complexity involving multiple interconnected forgeries and thefts of historic paintings from several institutions. And its resolution necessarily involves multiple detectives and forensic experts, each as colorful and eccentric in his own way as Inspector Clouseau. The victims, museum curators and aristo collectors, are a classier bunch who tend to both snobbery and hypocrisy, not the most admirable human beings. Classiest of all are the scheming thieves and forgers. You see, in today's genre fiction, perpetrators of these presumably victimless crimes against the upper class have the cachet of well-played chaps. In a previous generation, this place of honor was held by jewel thieves who connived to execute intricately plotted heists. Remember Cary Grant, never more dashing than in his role as John Roby in Hitchcock's To Catch a Thief? Professor Charney is going to teach you a lot about art history and criticism. His professor Barrow pontificates, I speak of observation, looking in order to gather information rather than merely looking. Look deeper. Observation followed by logical deduction leads to solution. You shall see. And isn't this just what the reader of a detective story must learn to do? Observe and deduce? The Art Thief is great fun, but my advice would be to keep a scratch pad handy. The crosses and the double crosses are so intertwined, you'll want to make a diagram to keep track. Gerald Everett Jones is the author of Bonfire of the Vanderbilts and host of the Get Published Radio Show.